I'd like to introduce Dan Bazile, who's a veteran journalist. He's covered the state capitol for Spectre Morning News. He's been the anchor there. This is his third time being with us here at the forum. So Dan, thank you for joining us. And I will turn it over to you. All right, good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for having me once again. I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm from Spectrum News One. And uh, from a reporter's perspective, you know, uh, we cover a lot of healthcare, you know, issues, tons of healthcare issues this year and last year, especially with COVID, but we've been covering a lot uh, with uh, long-term care as well. We've covered a lot of hospice situations. We've covered a lot of, uh, especially with uh, the issue of, well, uh, people not getting paid enough, so they're not uh, having a big shortage of workers. So that's been a lot in the news for us. Um, we also covered the um, the situation as it uh, as it uh, relates to medical aid and dying. That's a big deal going on right now. So we've covered a lot of that. But obviously, you know what we've we've come here to do is to talk about long term care. We covered a ton of that as well. So I won't bore you with that. Um, just to tell you that uh, you know the news from this perspective as a journalist. We don't get the, let's say, 100% of exactly what's brewing at the Capitol sometimes. We have to ask these questions, which is why we have some people here that will, will put their feet to the fire and try to get some answers for you as it relates to uh, elder care, long-term care. Uh, let me introduce you to this panel of discussion that we have today. Our panel includes uh, Senator McDonald. Senator McDonald, John McDonald is uh, from District 108 and uh, he's a former Cohoes mayor. I remember when you were Cohoes mayor, by the way. <laughs> that was fun to talk to you about Cohoes. Um, also talk to you about a member of the, uh, the assembly. And uh, he's a member of the Committee on Insurance Health and Health and Chair's Committee on Oversight uh, Analysis and, and Health. Senator, thing, I mean, Assemblyman, thank you so much for joining us here. We appreciate it. Also joining us on the podium on the stage today is Senator Sue Serino, and she represents District 41, and she is from Hyde Park, ranking member in the Senate of Aging Committee and Finance Insurance Committee. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. <laughs> nice to see you in person and virtually joining us we hope he's still joining us virtually, uh, is Assembly uh, Member Ron Kim. Do we have Ron Kim virtually? No? I'm right here. I'm right oh, here. Thank right you. Here. Perfect. I can't see you. Usually we can see, but thank you so much for joining us. You can hear me, which is perfect. I do have a ton of questions for you, so. <laughs> All right, get ready. All right, you guys, listen. Well, we're going to start with this, and, and we'll get some questions from, from the audience as well when, when we're sort of, you know, we are kind of get to the point where the time is getting there, but we have until 930, so let's try to get through this as fast as we can. Uh, first and foremost, guys, uh, you just went through uh, a big budget, big, huge budget. So what's in that budget? Uh, and, you know, this is in general terms. What is in that budget as it relates to health care, but more specifically, more specifically, elder and long-term care. Um, uh, I'll start with you, Senate uh, Assemblyman John McDonald. Does that work? Can you hear? Perfect. Well, first of all, good morning, everybody. A little bit concerning. Two microphones. Does that mean we can talk out of both sides of our mouth? <laughs> <laughs> We've been accused of that from time to time. So, anyways, you know, the short answer: What's in the budget? Money. A lot of money. The question is: Where is the money being spent? And I think that's the, the critical component. Um, obviously, one of the areas that we all agreed on and we really pushed for is to increase our, our funds for the workforce. It's no secret there's a workforce challenge going out there, no matter what part of long-term care you're talking about, whether it's at home, whether it's in the assisted living facilities, whether it's in the nursing homes. And we made a very conscious decision um, to really start to move the needle in regards to that. Because the reality is, at the end of the term, long-term care is all about human services and you need humans to perform it. So there's a lot of money in that area. Another area that I think is critical is we've put a lot of capital aside. Capital is important because it's, it's nice because it's a one-time expense. It's about $2.6 billion that'll be invested in the whole continuum of healthcare facilities. That includes hospitals, includes nursing homes. 
how that money is divvied up, it's a process through the Department of Health, um, which is can be laborious at times, but at the end of the day, uh, it's, it's critical because let's face it, um, the workforce issues, the structure issues, um, they didn't happen overnight. They didn't happen because of COVID, to be honest with you, but they were really fully fleshed out during COVID. Uh, so we're really trying to put some significant resources into something that admittedly, I don't think we attended to as well as we should have over the past decade. You gotta turn to the right. I know that. Yeah. Am I good? You're, on. You're good, yeah. Thank you. And thank you so much, uh, Lou, for hosting this. And Dan, this is really great. Uh, because I always say I govern by listening. So I really want to hear from the people that are here. And just to give you a, a slight background on me, I was an aging chair for the first four years and my concentration was on elder abuse. And when you think about that, and I see a lot of people from Dutchess County that are here, um, that's healthcare as well. And there is a lot of money um, this year in the budget. But when we think about the places that it needs to go, like we put money for the ombudsman, but we asked for 20 million, I think we got two and a half million because, right? But our ombudsmen, as you know, do such a great job and especially during the pandemic, they are the eyes in the facilities to be able, because there's a lot of people that, you know, don't have loved ones to, to care for them. And, and during the pandemic, we couldn't go in to see our loved ones. So um, they play a very critical role. And our healthcare workers, I think there's so much more that we should be doing to elevate you know, the people that are taking care of our most precious gifts, our parents and grandparents. You know, I just went through health issues with both my mother and mother-in-law in December. God bless them. I had them living together for a month. They survived it. But, um, you know, both of them had to be in a healthcare facility to start off with, which was great. We had great services. But, you know, when it comes to finding home care, I am involved in this and I had a struggle. So if it's a little difficult for me, and we have great office of the aging state and local, but there were still struggles that I found and I think that we need to make it easier. And I see a lot of people shaking their head yes, because we're, you know, it's that time when we're taking care of parents and, and grandparents that uh, really need that help. So I really wanna hear what everybody has to say today. And uh, Dan, thank you for giving us the opportunity. Assemblyman uh, Ron Kemp. Thank you, Dan. Um, and, I, I, and I'm so sorry that I can't be joining you in person today. Um, I am back in my district uh, in Flushing, Queens. Uh, one of my daughters, uh, like in 3K, she uh, was exposed to COVID and I have to uh, stay home and monitor her. Uh, this is something that I think so many working families are going through throughout the state. Um, but I join you today as the chair of the Committee on Aging, overseeing older adults in full partnership with our director of SOFA, Greg Olson, and his uh, team um, at the state level. And I, I, to answer your question, I think we fought really hard on both sides of the aisle this year uh, to really transform our state into a caring economy. Uh, that means stopping the leakage to uh, big corporations that do not care about the status of our caring economy in the state of New York, but investing directly into our workers to make sure that they feel emboldened, empowered to join the healthcare workers, uh, workforce, whether it's home care or long-term facilities. There is a crisis in our workforce and we have to pay them well and we have to make them feel like they're a valuable asset to our economy. And we took a couple of steps in the right direction. We have not reached a full caring economy yet. So we still have a ton of work to do, uh, but this budget had some significant increases uh, in the right place to get to get our state there, but we're not there yet. And I'm collectively uh, with the stakeholders in this room and decision makers in the next two, three years, I hope to transform this state into a caring economy where we don't take advantage of people's care work. We actually pay them well uh, to care for each other. All right, more specifically, guys, let's get some specifics going here. So uh, this year, are there any policies that you worked on or you're currently working on uh, to get the best health care 
and long-term care for seniors and people with disabilities. I know that's on this darn thing. So anyways, one of the areas that I've been spending a lot of time and interest in, and it's kind of, it's complicated to be honest with you, um, but it's an outcome of policy changes 30, 40 years ago. We have more individuals living longer, thankfully, uh, with disabilities. And at the same token, we have many people who are living in the community now with mental health issues and substance abuse issues. However, there's this dynamic that plays out where they end up in the hospital. And then the question is, where do we discharge them? Not every adult, listed adult facility or nursing home is geared for it. And nursing homes are required to take individuals and required to continue them on, on methadone, but it gets very problematic. So what we're working to do, working with the hospital association, but bringing in the other partners is, you know, is there a different model out there that we should be looking at? You know, the truth of the matter is 30, 40 years ago, wrongly, those individuals who had those issues were living in these arcane institutions and, and you know, consciously we all made that decision to bring them into the community. But guess what? Because of the success, they are actually living longer and we need to make sure that we have the appropriate setting for them. You know, I know that some of my studies, particularly in other countries, you actually have long-term care facilities How's that? that better? So in other countries, what they are doing is actually looking at, you know, our facilities geared for DD, DD population, our, our gears, uh, facilities geared for the OMH population, uh, because that way you have the opportunity for staff to get trained and to be able to identify the challenges, because sometimes with those populations, communication is a challenge. The reason why this problem became, to my awareness, is the hospitals have a lot of individuals who don't need to be in the hospital taking up beds, particularly for people who need them. And so therefore it's, it's, it's a process, it's something we're working on, trying to get an idea of what the best practices are to see what we can put in place. What about you, Senator? Sorry about that. Uh, you know, aging in place is so important, and I think we have to do more to enable our seniors to be able to stay home. And maybe that's like thinking outside of the box when we have some of our healthcare providers, uh, whether we to apply daycare or if we right now look at what gas cost. And I can't begin to tell you how much I'm hearing from even seniors. It's it's so high. So do we give some kind of a gas reimbursement? Because we are flush with money right now and hopefully things are gonna turn around because that's always a concern too. When we put money forward now, what happens a couple of years down the road? And I know we can both tell you one of the first things that gets cut is the healthcare budget. And, um, and it's always, and who gets affected the most? Our vulnerable populations. In fact, Bill Hammond, um, we had a great conversation. We had a panel with him and he talked about, you know, when it comes times for the hearings in Albany and Greg, you know this very well now and Becky, um, that we cram everything in one day. Well, maybe we need two different days. One to just specifically concentrate on Medicaid and then the other to talk about everything else. Uh, you know, how we can better improve and help our seniors. So that was an idea that he threw out there that I thought was pretty helpful because, right, our hearings can go 13 hours and, you know, it's a lot crammed into one day. And this is so critical uh, for us to be talking about it. And I think pre preserving the consumer directed personal assistance program, the CDPAP program, is really important because nobody can care for our loved ones like, like we do, right? Um, and uh, you know, I talked about the incentives and improving telehealth and telepsychiatry, which uh, you guys are gonna hear about later today, which is great. And right before the pandemic, I had Dr. Baki in our district who uh, opened up a facility at a closed um, golf course. And he had invented a patch that our loved ones could wear in the home that would detect uh, blood pressure if you fell. There were five different components. I don't remember them off the top of my head, hooked up to a nurse or a doctor that they could communicate. Can you imagine? I know myself, after seeing what happened with my m mom and mother-in-law, that would have made me feel so much better. Um, he has since moved from there, but I'm very excited about uh, Lou's 
working with the Columbia Green and the pilot program that you hear about later today, because I think that's really important. Uh, you know, when I talked about the multidisciplinary teams earlier, I learned about that in one of, I think one of my first years as uh, the aging chair, we did a round table. You heard me say, I, I govern by listening. And I met Anne-Marie Cook and she told me how Lifespan was doing such incredible work. And we were able to um, expand that in the state because like I said, taking care of elder abuse and taking care of our seniors is healthcare too. So thank you. Um, Assemblyman Kim, any uh, word on what uh, policies and uh, you may be working on or have worked on or working on right now to, uh, uh, to help better health care and uh, to help seniors? Yes, uh, well, I join my colleagues um, on working on uh, so many different types of policies and issues over the last few years. But in particular, um, I feel proud of the fact that we work together to restore uh, patient and nursing home residents' rights, which, was, uh, which were stripped away from them at the peak of COVID um, in the form of a near blanket uh, legal immunity for these industries that took away uh, people's recourse. And that was critically important because 25 years ago, when we went through similar um, meltdowns with nursing homes, we strengthened um, nursing home residents' rights so to, we, to give them a uh, better recourse. And instead of, instead of giving them further rights, this time around, we took those rights away from them. So we repealed that law, restored those rights for them, uh, but now we need to do more to strengthen their rights, to make sure that they're protected. But right now, um, some of the areas that I'm focused on is looking at how we uh, finance some of these nursing homes and how uh, we need to improve the payment infrastructure um, that is failing to get from point A to point C because there's so many intermediaries and middle points that public benefit dollars are being extracted from. And this is the, these are comprehensive problems. But when we have a state where 65 to 70% of long-term uh, facilities are privatized and underwritten and financed by private equity and hedge fund money, it is not going to end well. And it's not ending well. So we need to have a serious questions about how do we finance these facilities where we prioritize care and not profits for private equity firms. Uh, you know, Assemblyman Kim, I'm glad you brought this up because I'm gonna start with you, the next question here. And since you brought up money and finance, you know, long-term care is very, very expensive. Uh, is there anything, I mean, you talked about hedge funds and all kinds of money controlling this, privatizing. Is there anything that the, the state can do? State lawmakers can help afford uh, these things and have people continue to live in their communities. I'm going to start with you, uh, Assemblyman Kemp. I think we need, we first need public accountability of the dollars that are in place right now. I, I know I, I've been an adamant supporter of fair pay uh, for, to make sure that workers are getting their wages. But if we keep throwing money into a system that's fundamentally broken and there's so many extractive points that we have no idea where the money is going. We need to disaggregate the operations of every nursing home, for-profit nursing home, and have full transparency, administrative transparency, where the money is going, uh, first and foremost, to get a grasp of where the leakage is. And then we need to figure out the revenue streams. Um, I'm all for finding new revenue, sustainable revenue, not one-time federal money, but sustainable revenue streams to build the caring infrastructure. But we first need a grip on the public side and pu full of public accountability of how we're spending this money efficiently uh, in real time. Senator Serena, you have a different perspective on this? And I have to say, Assemblyman Kim was such a champion um, for our seniors and, uh, you know, like his work with what he's doing with the nursing homes too. You know, he's someone who lost his uncle and I, I can't thank him enough for all of his work. Um, and I think, you know, when it comes to the nursing homes that like in my district, I have great nursing homes. I, we really weren't getting complaints, but we know that there are nursing homes in other areas that, you know, like one of my colleagues had both of his parents in the nursing home and there were issues. 
I think there's, this is a really big part of the conversation. Like right now, I know going through the pandemic, our local Department of Health, really their hands were tied and they could have played such a critical role and their voices really were not heard. The state you know, took control and we really need to have, I'm a person that believes in local control. And I think that uh, we really needed to do more of that uh, with our nursing homes to help them. And, and you know, there were just different things that were going on. They were short staffed before during the pandemic. I said, look at all the people in the hospitality field that lost their jobs. They could have hired maybe somebody like that to answer the phones to talk to our loved ones or, or maybe help with the counts. Like I know with the herds, that was uh, taking up a lot of time to find out what supplies they had. They were critically important, but it was just a lot. So there's a lot of mandates, a lot of times Albany puts mandates on things and uh, you know, there's a lot of ramifications that come with that too. So there's gotta be a balance basically. Senator? So, you know, Ron brings up a, a good point and we did pass legislation to really kind of, for those facilities that are accepting public money, we really said here, 70% of that money is going on patient care. So that's an important note because the reality is it's public money. Um, really one of the bigger challenges is, is preparing people for the future. I think it's hard. I think we go about living our lives and all of a sudden a wheel falls off and then it goes downhill. And, you know, we need to be able to provide vehicles for people that they want to put money aside tax-free for long-term care. They can. I'm more of a, you know, I'm a former mayor. Okay. And I've been a pharmacist for 38 years. So I'm a community guy. I don't know many people say, Hey, drain my savings and put me in a nursing home tomorrow. I don't hear that too often. We realize too, nursing homes have really become um, that last step for most people. And it's, it's, you know, emotionally, it's extraordinarily challenging for, for the family members. And it puts a lot of pressure on the nursing home staff as well. You know, I do think that we need to continue to reinvest in the community services. And most people, as a former mayor, I can tell you, I want my community members to stay in my community as long as they can. So we need to bring that care to them because we also know, speaking to the affordability issue, it's usually the most cost-effective use of our public dollars. Can I just add something to that? Absolutely. You know, when you think about it, we, we work, we save for our retirement, and then it's all swept away. There's gotta be a way, right, that that, like you mentioned, assembly member, that that doesn't happen. But, and you mentioned earlier too, how people years ago, what was the average age that people would live to if it was 70 now? Look at all the centurion birthdays that we go to. People are living much longer and we have not accounted for that. So this is another part of the conversation that we have to, to figure out. And I think that comes by having hearings, having round tables. We have a great uh, Office of the Aging for the state. They have done so much incredible work for our seniors that I can't thank them enough. So you guys are a godsend. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start with you then, uh, Senator, with the next question. Uh, you know, we do, we did a lot of stories this year on, uh, the, the shortage, the worker shortage at nursing homes, at facilities like, uh, hospice and, and part of the reason for that we found also doing our stories is because, well, the pay is pretty low, right? People can often make more money working at, let, let's say a fast food restaurant than they work at a healthcare facility. So how do we fix the system? I mean, we're just, where do we get this money to pay them more? Uh, what, how do we fix this? Because I mean, it needs to be fixed. We need to care more about the folks that are in long-term care facilities. I'm gonna start with you, Senator. Oh, well, I'm sorry that you're starting with the assembly member. You know, budgets are about priorities. And I feel like our seniors, our vulnerable populations are always the last that get the attention. And we really need to make sure that our seniors can live and stay in the communities that they love, or if they're in a nursing home, that we're able to have workers that um, love to do the job, paid to do their job. You know, we have a lot of rural communities where it's very hard for people to get other places. You know, they have daycare, like I said before, uh, the price of gas. And also I think, you know, I'm a person that didn't take the traditional path. So I just did a big trades event in my district. Had, and at night, between six and eight, I had 300 parents and kids come. That's huge. 
they were all engaged because the pandemic taught us we have to start thinking outside of the box. So I think even engaging kids in middle school, you know, because I always said, like, I've always had a love for seniors and it probably came for, from my very close relationship with my grandparents, but there are a lot of young people like that. How do we engage them and then into high school to have them want to go into these fields, but we have to make it where, you know, you have a title that, hey, this is a profession and I'm so proud to do this job and I'm getting compensated for it. Those are a couple of key issues that I think are really important to make people feel appreciated because like I said, they're taking care of our, our gifts in life. Assemblyman. So a couple of thoughts. What well, in the budget we did, I think put down a fair down payment on recognizing the underpayments to those in home care. Um, you know, part of the challenge with budgets and Sue's right, it is about priorities is that, uh, you know, once you raise it, then it just builds off that each year. And the question is, yeah, right now for four years, we're in a good position from a state perspective. I've, I've been here 10 years and I've been in government now for 22 years. It's never been like this, but the re and at the same token, I can tell you there were many of my colleagues who wanted to just blow the whole lot out there right away. And I'm like, oh God, we can't do that. That's not really fiscally responsible because at some point, it's going to come back to haunt us. We're going to have to make those cuts. So, you know, I think we, we moved ahead, I think respectfully this year, it kind of narrowed that gap between the person working in a, in a long-term care facility versus working at Burger King. Um, but we still have much more to do. I think the other thing too, is that in the workforce development, we need to kind of expand into areas we normally don't. You know, I represent the city of Albany along with the other four cities in the capital region. We have 10,000 children in our schools. They don't participate in some of the BOCES programs like New Visions that in their sophomore and junior years introduces children to healthcare. We need to expand those programs. One of the items I know it does cause some friction with the public education system. Um, they are looking at a charter nursing school, uh, particularly in Arbor Hill. In other words, bring the school to the communities that have been underserved. Give those children an opportunity to embrace healthcare during their whole high school career. We have Albany Med and St. Peter's, two of the largest healthcare operations, no disrespect to Alice, because I can't tell who's merging with who this day and age. But the reality is, is that these can be good paying jobs. And as we have more people involved in the system, yes, we may pay some more money in some aspects, but also if we're going along the lines of what the Medicaid DISRIP 2.0 uh, theory is, is that we wanna have better outcomes. And that's really where we need to put those resources and workforce. And I'm hoping that the 1115 waiver does get approved because I think that's gonna help us uh, change that conversation. Assemblyman Kim, can you uh, add yeah. to this? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with my colleagues that we took um, some steps in the right direction. Uh, but in my mind, there's no way that we can ever go back into austerity mode. Um, the steps that we're moving toward, we need to keep taking those steps. Um, last year, when we, when we talked about taxing the ultra wealthy and having progressive tax income uh, taxes in our system, there was so much pushback uh, of capital leaving, the billionaires leaving our state. No one left our state. We, we received record number of revenues as a result of the nominal work we did on taxing the ultra, ultra rich, not the middle class, not the upper middle class, the top brackets. We, but we still haven't touched the real wealthy class of New York State. We haven't touched capital gains, which is what the president and uh, Joe Biden wants to do. But if the federal government gets to fixing the capital gains preferential rates at the federal level first, that's money that's going from New York to the federal government. If New York State acts first, we by closing that loop, well, this is money that people rely on income for capital gains. These are very rich people that don't rely on labor income for capital gains. If we are able to close that gap and generate those revenues, that's just eight to $10 billion of sustainable revenue that we can put back into our system and fully fund uh, home care and other parts of our healthcare system. 
These are some of the tougher discussions I think we need to have again going into next year's budget uh, to figure out where we can get the revenues without cutting programs moving forward. Um, I just have a quick follow up question. We'll, we'll get to your questions in just a moment. This one, because I just want to ask this, uh, since you mentioned that there's a down payment, you know, and, and the question was about what, you know, what would make the job more attractive? And that question still stands. Uh, so look, chicken is eventually going to be $900 a pound. I mean, I know that, <laughs> I know that, uh, I, 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 <laughs> I know that inflation is, is transitory, according to Chairman Powell. So we know it's probably at some point going to go back down. But eventually, chicken will be $900 a pound. So life is getting expensive. What is fair exactly in terms of wage for anybody is, is I guess it could be uh, subjective, right? But what is a living wage? I mean, some people are laughing about the down payment that this, the government put down on, on this on this. So what what do you guys think at this point at this juncture would be a fair pay for these workers so that they can actually stay and 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 we can have people stay at work to help those those folks who are uh, getting care long term care facilities. So in the the effort, which was very large to increase wages for home care, I think we're shooting for the 2250 an hour range. That's what we were shooting for. We came up short. There's no doubt about that, but that was the goal. I don't can't tell you what the exact wage is going to be. I've been, geez, what was it, five years ago? We were having a discussion about minimum wage. Everyone's like, oh my God, $15 an hour. Well, Stewart's is paying 16 bucks an hour if you're looking for a job right now. So obviously it does move with the times. It moves with the with the, it, it's a matter of supply and demand. And right now, the, the challenge is, and we haven't even gotten into the nurses' conversation. You know, I spent, I don't know where I was yesterday. I was someplace. But <laughs> this discussion, I was talking to Dick Goffrey, our longtime health chair, about this, that, you know, nurses are getting $250 an hour now for nursing care. It's just that the, the supply is so low, it's pushed up the demand, it's pushed up the wages. But where we find that point, I don't know. But it, it definitely has to be, you know, we're talking about caring for human beings and there's a whole set of rules and regulations and precautions and guidelines. It's not for the faint of heart. It's got to be something that is commensurate with the responsibility that they have. Yeah, you know, uh, I think it's Target now is paying $22.50 $22.50 an hour. So people are looking at that just like when we were doing the minimum wage, right? That was the same thing. Why should I go work here when I can go and work and flip burgers at $15 an hour? I think um, we have, like I said, oh, I always talk about thinking outside of the box. And, you know, right now I carry legislation that would establish a pilot program. I love pilot programs because we can try them and, and see how they work. And it would be to re uh, recruit and train retired workers to work in home care. And another one is to allow the commissioner of health to adjust the medical assistant rates to target recruitment, training, and retention of the direct care workers for services in shortage areas and, and disciplines, and legislation to direct the uh, commissioner to conduct um, their own investigations, a labor market study, I'm sorry, a labor market study. But those are just some different ideas that I think that we need to do. But it, it boils down to people are looking what they're going to, what are they going to get paid? How do they pay for gas? How do they pay for fuel oil right now, which is almost $7 an hour, the chicken that's going to be $900, because look at everything is going up. And right now we do have funds that that we could help, but we also have to do other programs that, you know, maybe can help. Like I said, like retired workers, there are seniors that want to have um, a different, you know, another another life after they've retired from a position. So there are different things that we can do, but this is how we learn, right? We have round tables, we talk about it, we hear from the community, that's how we get ideas and that's how we bring legislation because we know that we have to address this issue. That's the number one thing that people are looking at. How much am I gonna get paid because how am I gonna afford to live here if I'm not getting paid a good wage? Uh, Assemblyman Kim, real quick, I'm told I have 10 minutes, so I gotta get to some questions from the audience, but if you can add anything to this. Yeah, I, I think 20, 
twenty to twenty five dollars an hour plus enforcing overtime to make sure that the wor workers who do twenty four hour shifts get paid for every hour that they work. Um, then these workers are making anywhere between you know seventy five to one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. That's what they deserve. Now I want to just give a quick shout out again to to Greg uh, who oversees. Um, the implementation of non-Medicaid home care workers that are contracted with county governments uh, that, that serve 15,000 older adults in home care, and they get paid very well, and they get public benefits. There's also there's a model in there in SOFA that also works very well in home care, and we, sh we should be diving into the areas that we do well to learn from them to, to start implementing some hybrid programs that could be long-term solutions for the home care industry. Okay, I have 10 minutes, five minutes ago. So I'm gonna need, I'm gonna need to ask some questions to the audience uh, real quick. And we're gonna try to keep the answers real quick, guys, very short. Uh, just raise your hands and I'll come to you uh, with a microphone. Anybody with a question? Okay, that gentleman back there. What's your question? Uh, thank you, Dan, and, and thank you all for your fantastic legislative advocacy. It's greatly appreciated. My, oh, my name is Sim Goldman. I'm general counsel with the Independent Living Center of the Hudson Valley, formerly with Disability Rights New York. Many of you know me. Uh, you also know that I've been in and out of nursing facilities through my entire career, and um, what I've seen is not good. I know you are talking about making changes and they're needed in nursing facilities and improving them. But what I wanna suggest and ask your comments on briefly is, why not consider moving to a different model? Nobody, nobody wants to live and end their life with a roommate that they don't choose, not getting the care they need so they can get to a toilet and, and, and end up soiling themselves. Uh, in, in, the, in these understaffed facilities. The problem is endemic. It has been going on for years. Some of you may remember the Heinz Commission from the 1970s. It's not going to change whether or not these are run by private equity or run by county governments or run by not-for-profits. Yes, some are better than others. There is no question. But let's move to a different model. We can't turn this around on a dime but let's move to a different model. Do you have any thoughts uh, on that? And again, I thank you very much for what you're doing. Sim, thank you. And you know, we've known each other for a long period of time. You know, I think there are new models out there that we're looking at. Personally, you know, in my community at Cohoes, years ago when we were mayor, we tore down the nursing home and we built the greenhouses, first in the state of New York. It's a place you'd want your mother to be in if she had to go to a nursing home. It's individualized to your point, but also has the opportunity for community, but on a much smaller scale. And also by changing up the workforce, they're able to actually provide that type of attentive care. I, I, I agree. I think the days of, like I said, I, I don't know many people who wanna go and say, I wanna live on wing 4F and smell urine all day long. That's not what they want. They want dignity. And I think um, it's desired. You know, I can speak easily about that for upstate New York, I can't offer a solution for New York City because it's a whole different dynamic. Because at the end of the day, the biggest issue, and Sue will attest to this, and so will Ron, every single day I get calls for help to get somebody in a nursing home, but they want it in their neighborhood. <laughs> they don't want to be moving from New York City upstate. Yeah, and that's a great question too. You know, I think it was in Kingston, there was a woman that had opened some smaller homes where she would have, you know, like five beds for people, five rooms, and that was a different model. It was a different idea. But I also think we have to think on a larger scale too, like some of these senior housing. What about senior communities? I know they do these a lot down south, but wouldn't it be nice because transportation is a, is a huge issue. Seniors don't really want to drive anymore, but they want to be able to get to whatever they wherever they have to go. So if you have a health component, 
in that community and also other um you know other things like in in new jersey it was interesting they you know, just saw it i forgot where i read it but they had all of these rooms in this facility that would bring back memories for people with alzheimer's uh like a, a 50s uh ice cream salon and you could go into all of these different rooms it's just people are thinking outside of the box on how we can have people stay in a community because that's really important we need to have people stay in the communities uh, and we should be able to do that Assemblyman, yeah, I believe about 20% of institutionalized uh, older adults don't need to be there if we have a better home care system in our in place. That's that's number one. And secondly, I did visit a couple of places in Albany area uh, that had these hybrid models where they converted their homes into long-term facilities. They pre but these these patients, these residents, are paying out of pocket a lot of money to stay in these homes. So if we open up Medicaid, Medicare somehow to op to to allow these new hybrid models to expand, I think that can be very functioning, uh, functional. But overall, I do believe uh, the, the public sector could play a better role. Um, I disagree that um, you know, uh, in terms of county-run and publicly-run nursing homes being as equally as bad as private equity or nonprofits. I think the, the COVID has shown that the county run nursing homes during this um, time perform better and nonprofits perform better. Um, so if we can go back um, to talk about what the public can do to take over potentially of failing these facilities, because we always go the other way. We go to the private sector, but we have never come in and use our public good and public stick to say, if you're not performing, if you're not, if you're rating bad, we will come in and take over these facilities and do a better job. I think there has to be some discussions around around that. I'm not sure if we have time for one more. Do we have time for one more question? Okay, we do. All right. Uh, I had you raising your hands a long time ago. So we're going to go to, uh, go ahead, stand up. Go ahead, stand up. We're going to go to you right there. Thank you so much. One more question, guys. And keep your answers a little okay. short. Um, Please. My name is Marion Power, and I'm a geriatric care manager and nurse in Dutchess County. And I, um, what you said, I feel very strongly the same, is that what I see is that the model of nursing homes, even though, again, I appreciate all that you're doing, I, I wouldn't want to put any of my clients in a nursing home in Dutchess County if I have a choice. And if they have a choice, um, it costs $15,000 a month. They could do home care for nine and get one-on-one -on -one care. And I just, I think the visits that I've made in different nursing homes that have a very strong, you know, you, you think they're going to be very good. I, I just feel the communication to the family and how they're taken care of isn't, isn't great, especially for that amount of money, which just feels like it could go into something better. Um, so that's my first comment. And then the second one is that home care workers that I have it with my families, the idea of a wage going up is great. Thank you. They also don't have any benefits anymore. Um, tw 20 years ago, they had vacation pay, insurance. They had a lot of benefits and they go home on vacation and they get no vacation pay. So the whole time they go home, they're not getting paid and they've been working for years in an agency. So that seems to also be an issue. Um, I love the idea of greenhouses and making a new model, um, intergenerational communities. Um, yeah, it's a big step and I don't know how it will happen, but it feels that the nursing home piece is, is just no longer how we can function in my opinion. So thank you. Thank you and it's, sound, oh, sorry. It sounds like we have to have another round table in Dutchess, <laughs> but, um, you know, because my experience from hearing from people, you know, like in our community, I didn't have a lot of bad feedback, you know, in fact, both my mother and mother-in-law were in a nursing home for a short period of time before I put the two moms together. Uh, and we were able to get them some health care, but there's always places that we can improve, but there's also the hard reality too, that there are people, right, that, don't have loved ones and, and might have to be in, in the different nursing home facilities or what have you, but it's really, that's a bigger 
bigger part of the conversation that I think that we all need to start having. Like I said, we're all starting to think of different ideas and this is very helpful. So thank you. So we'll plan a round table with you guys. That's my Duchess table. Thank you guys. The one thing I'll add to your comment, you know, I mentioned earlier is $2.6 billion for transformational capital investments. And to be starting off simple, like getting back to Sidman's, Sid's comment about single rooms and maybe it'll spur on more greenhouse type effects. Um, and then, of course, the other areas is that, you know, I, I've seen it in the chat. I've seen a lot of things in the chat today, but the whole idea of the NORCs being reinvested in, too, is important, too. They make a huge difference. Just, one, just quickly, the, the Wage Parity Act that we passed for home care workers requires uh, the home agencies to provide livable wages by law right now and provide fringe benefits. There's a discrepancy throughout the state on how, how that's being implemented. And so we need a full accounting to make sure that home care workers right now under the law are receiving those benefits that you said they're not receiving. Uh, and that's a serious problem that we also need to go back and fix. And in fact, uh, a recently arbitrated case came out said 42 home care agencies have committed even wage theft for the last 10 years and they've settled woefully low settlement, but it identifies structural problems of reimbursements and how they're not how the state is not enforcing the very wage laws and overtime laws that we passed because the entire system is just broken and we need to come back to the table collectively as an industry and, and as the state agencies to fix the broken pipeline for home care. And so comes to the conclusion of this, but it seems Lastly, I just want to say, no matter how you slice and dice it, or you want to call different models, there seems to be an underlying theme, as they tell us journalists, follow the money. It seems to be money is the big problem. We thank you so much, uh, Assemblyman Ron Kim, and Senator Susserino, and Assemblyman John McDonald. We thank you for this. We were very much appreciate it. Thank you to all for listening. Check one, two, there we go. Well, thank you so much. That was a great start to the day. I can't tell you what's going on in the chat rooms right now online, but it is smoking. Um, they, they woke up our audience at home. Thank you, John. And uh, it, these issues are not easy issues. And how, how many times have you heard three legislators get up and say, hey, we're flush with cash? That's a first. We've been doing this 27 years. That's the first time that we've heard that from our legislative panel. 